couple of technical issues here. The uh, measurements that are given here are all in terms of what is called a long cubit. A cubit is 18 inches from fingertip to elbow. A long cubit adds a hand breadth, adds three inches. So a long cubit is 21 inches long. And that's what is used here for whatever reason. That's not spelled out. And the measuring stick that the man uses is a rod. And the rod is 10 cubits long. Let me be sure about that. Six cubits long. There we go. Six cubits long. 126 inches. So it's 10 and a half feet. And I'm using the New Living Translation tonight because it's all in feet, and that's uh, good. So, so the rod is 10 and a half feet long, so like so. And he's using that as his standard measurement. He also has a cord, which probably was marked in cubit lengths. And when you look then at the figures here, for instance, um, how high is the wall? It's 10 and a half feet tall. How wide is the wall? It's 10 and a half feet wide. The um, court is 17, uh, 175 feet wide, which is 100 cubits. The, um, most of the measurements are in terms of either the rod or in tens of the cubits. So the um, Holy of Holies is 35 feet square, 17 and a half by 17 and a half, or double 17 and a half, I should say. And so it's all figured in those kinds of terms and used in those multiples of 10 cubits or of 6 cubits, depending on the rod. Um, there's been endless amounts of discussion over whether this was ever intended to be literally built or not. Uh, for most of the church's history, it was argued, no, not. It is symbolic of Christ, symbolic of the church. Uh, but in the uh, middle of the 19th century, 1800s, a man named John Nelson Darby revived the idea of the premillennial return of Christ. Up until this time, the primary theory was postmillennial. That is, the church is going to bring in the kingdom. And after the kingdom has been realized, then Christ will return. That's what John Wesley believed. Uh, it's what Daniel Steele, uh, one of the uh, stalwarts of the holiness movement, uh, believed. Uh, right, God is going to perfect his people, and he's going to bring in the millennium through us. And it's interesting, Daniel Steele, who was a professor at Boston University, in the days when Boston University was not what it is now, uh, spoke out very harshly against the pre-millennial return. That is the idea, no, 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 no. Things are not going to get better. Things are going to get worse and worse and worse until finally... Jesus is going to have to come, and he's going to bring in the thousand-year reign, and the temple will be rebuilt on the plan of Ezekiel. And the, we will have sacrifices again because Jews need sacrifices to be saved, and so forth and so on. So premillennialism became a very, very strong uh, movement 
in the late 1900s and then into the early years of the 20th century. I well remember uh, when I was in college, I attended a little country church in Indiana, and uh, one old gentleman said, I used to be a post-millennialist, and then I got converted, and now I'm a premillennialist. <laughs> so that whole idea that, yes, there will be a literal, and the post-millennial idea is not necessarily that there will be a literal kingdom per se. Premillennial, yes, there will be a literal 1,000-year kingdom that Jesus will rule and so, for that reason, it has been uh, argued more recently in the lifetime of some of us uh, that, yes, it will be literally built on the pattern that we have here. The big problem with that, and that's what I wanted to illustrate to you, is nobody can agree from these directions what it will look like. And so the three illustrations that I had are radically different. This is not a good enough blueprint <laughs> to build something literally. And uh, so uh, that's, that's the issue. And I, I, am, I am a premillennialist. I do think things are getting worse. <laughs> and that Jesus is going to have to come back to straighten it out. But I do not believe that this was meant to be literally built. I think this is uh, symbolic of uh, Christ and of the church. And we'll talk about that in some detail. Um, sure? You know, it's just one of these things I get confused. Um, the post-millennial, is that kind of like the people that don't believe the rapture? No. That would be the ah millennial. They don't think there's going to be a millennium. And most, most of the uh, five point Calvinists, the reformers, reformists, are ah millennial. Yeah, yeah. Christ is going to come back, they believe. The Bible is clear on that. But they don't believe there's going to be a rapture. We're not going to get out of here. <laughs> so get ready. <laughs> yes. 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 And and again, just a full disclosure, that's who I am. I'm a mid-tribulation rapture guy. <laughs> My reason for that is the two witnesses who are taken out of the world in the middle of the tribulation, I think, are the church. But I've been wrong at least once before, so. Uh, <laughs> Pardon? <laughs> no, don't ask my wife. <laughs> okay, I've talked with you quite a bit about Ezekiel seeing the return from exile as a new exodus. So in that light, think about the end of the book of Exodus. What have we got there? The tabernacle. The tabernacle. We've got 16 chapters. Here's how you should build the tabernacle. Golden calf. Here's how we did build the tabernacle. <laughs> Second time, we got it right. <laughs> Again, I've said to you, and this is a trick question, what was the Exodus for? God coming home. God coming home. As he says in Chapter 19 of Exodus, I bore you to myself on eagle's wings. So the Exodus is not, first of all, about getting them into Canaan. 
The Exodus is, first of all, about God getting into them. And so the tabernacle is that, again, expression of God coming down off the mountain to live in their midst. And so it's entirely fitting that the book of Ezekiel should end as the book of Exodus ends, with God coming home. But as I've tried to say to you, when you look at the move of the Bible, God isn't going to be content to live in a building. God's goal is to come all the way home. That's what he wants to do. And that's why I think, and, and I should say I'm not alone here, <laughs> I, I, I only found one commentator who argued strongly for a literal uh, fulfillment here. All the rest are saying, no, this is where God is headed in terms of what he wants to accomplish. Now, the question is, if that's true, why in the world all this detail? And we'll want to talk about that. But uh, there it is. So, so new exodus. Yes, God came home to live in the midst of the camp, in the tabernacle. But in the end, God wants to come home into the middle of his people's hearts. He wants to tabernacle among them. Remember John, first chapter? He tabernacled among us. And we have seen his grace and truth. Okay. Uh, I, a note here. Uh, remember the term that John uses? Abide. Abide. I like that. It's, it's a totally archaic term now, and, and as I get older, I like archaic terms, but uh, uh, contemporary translations of John 14 and 15 will typically say, uh, I want to live, or I want to dwell. I like abide, because abide talks more permanent, yes, yes, more of a sense of the depth of what's going on, uh, we're, we're at home. And Jesus says, I want to abide with you. I want to abide in your presence. I want you to abide in me as I abide in the Father. Wow. So I think that's what's going on in these chapters. <laughs> now, I've said to you again numerous times, but remember about repetition. The second part of Exodus, in many ways, duplicates elements from the first. Watchmen, the mountains, individual responsibility, those things get duplicated in the second half. Now here's another duplication. What are we duplicating here from the first part of the book? The vision of the temple in chapters 8, 9, 10, and 11. And it's interesting, if you look here at chapter 40, the Lord took hold of me. In a vision from God, he took me to the land of Israel, set me down on a very high mountain. From there I could see toward the south what appeared to be a city. And he brought me nearer. I saw a man whose face shone like bronze standing beside a gateway entrance. He was holding in his hand a linen measuring cord and a measuring rod. Now if you go back to chapter 8, it's a little more dramatic. The Lord took hold of me. That's the end of verse 1. I saw a figure that appeared to be a man. From what appeared to be the waist down, he looked like a burning flame. From the waist up, he looked like gleaming amber. He reached out what seemed to be a hand and took me by the hair. <laughs> then the spirit lifted me up into the sky and transported me to Jerusalem in a vision. So very similar language. 
this remarkable man figure who takes hold of him and takes him to the temple. Um, so what's the difference between these two? What is 8 to 11 describing? The wickedness in the temple, the idolatry, the corruption of the temple. And as I said to you, I think this is aimed straight at Ezekiel. Remember, Ezekiel was trained to be a priest. And his calling as a prophet came to him on his 30th birthday, which is when he would have started his priesthood if he'd been back home. So I suspect he's pining for that gorgeous temple back there in Jerusalem. And God says, you don't understand. You don't understand what's really going on there. I have no obligation to that place at all, except to destroy it. So that's the picture there of the corruption of the temple. And again, repetition. <laughs> What's the climax of that vision there in 8, 9, 10, and 11? The glory of the Lord leaving the temple. Slowly, <laughs> regretfully, rises from the threshold, the altar, to the gate, and finally to the Mount of Olives and gone. So that's the picture there. Now, if you've been reading, I presume you've only read 40 and 41, but what's the difference? What, what's happening here? What, what's the content here in these two chapters? The temple's being rebuilt. Okay, the temple's being rebuilt. And, and, and what's the content here? It's all directions. It's all figures. It's numbers. <sighs> okay. This, this, this glorious man is measuring it. Yes, yes. How, how, do you, how do you compare those two? One is, this is a filthy, defiled, corrupted temple. And here's this temple with these measurements. What's the comparison? Would it be like our lives? Like, let's stand in that thing. You've got to thank God for come and fill the temple. Okay, okay. If sin is cleaned out, God can come and fill the temple? Uh huh. One is man made, the other one is, is already made. Okay, one's man made, another is, is ready made. I'm just interested in why all these numbers. Well, these measurements. And you're not going to tell me why. Well, well, well. Pardon? Could this be the temple? Well, you know, earlier when God had changed the part, the where this be a. Yeah, yeah, it could be, but I, I, I still, it, it doesn't explain all these numbers. All right, there's a concreteness to the numbers. Symmetry, perfection. Symmetry, perfection. Go to chapter 42. This is next week, but that's all right. Verse 10. Son of man, describe to the people of Israel the temple I have shown you, so they will be ashamed of their sin. Let them study its plan, and they will be ashamed of what they have done. Describe to them all the specifications of the temple, including... I'm sorry, 43. I'm sorry. Wrong page. Wrong page. 43. 43. Let them study its plan and they will be ashamed of what they've done. 
describe to them all the specifications of the temple, including its exits and entrances and everything else about it. Hmm. Okay, everything has a purpose. Whatever else you say about how definite or indefinite this is, there are some things that are very definite. And unquestionably, the outer wall is a perfect square. 875 feet on a side. And in the wall are these massive gatehouses. The same place on all three sides. The same dimensions of all three. One of the questions I asked there was to compare. You have a long, long discussion of the east gate and then shorter ones of the south and the north saying it's the same. <laughs> now it's fascinating. Um, so anyway, everything, everything is symmetrical. Everything is in multiples. When you get to the temple, the holy room is two by one. <laughs> it's twice as long as it is wide. The holy place is perfectly square. Everything is in these multiple numbers, symmetrical, matching, everything fitting together in remarkable format. So that's what's going on. God is saying to them, look at the perfection that I have planned for you. Look at what your lives were meant to be and look at what they have become and be ashamed. But not only ashamed, be hopeful. Because this is not only what might have been, it's what can be. So that that's what's going on in all of these careful numbers. Now, that being said, what are the dimensions of the outside wall? Ten and a half feet square. It's, it's a rod, a rod wide and a rod high. Now, what about a ten and a half foot wall? It's very thick. It's not tall enough to be defensive. Get a good pogo stick and you can go over it. What's it there for? Separation. Separation. It's not defensive. It's not military. It is saying, here is the holy area. That'll be mentioned two or three times as we go on. Separating the holy from the common. So here again, go all the way back to Leviticus. What was the problem with Nadab and Abihu? They said it's just God. He said make the fire that way. That's too complicated. Walmart has a special deal on fire. It's just God. And after they die, God says to Moses, this is what I meant when I said, by those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. Nancy? The dimensions. It's 875 feet. 
Yes. And those are gates? Yes. And the gates are 85 feet tall. The what? Yes. Yes. The gates are 85 feet tall. Like that. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, here's the wall and here's the gate. <laughs> when you look at these kinds of pictures, you, you see this. The gates, and, and remember, um, in ancient times, the gate refers to the structure. What we might call the gates are the doors. So if you look down on it from on top, um, there's a threshold there, and then there are um, three guard rooms and then there is an entry hall. <clears throat> this is roofed over, and in, in the standard gate, there are wooden doors between every one of those sets of walls. And you've got suicide troops in these guard rooms. So, if the enemy breaks through the first set of doors, here are a bunch of guys ready to kill them. If they break through the second set of doors <laughs> and the third set, if they get through the fourth set, <coughs> cash in your insurance. <laughs> <laughs> so, in these descriptions, that's what you see. You see these guard rooms, and again, the... Um, um, Gates, chapter 40, is 87 and a half feet from one end to the other. We had a, we had a, <laughs> a fascinating time, let me say it that way in our New Living Translation discussions, trying to figure out what in the world the Hebrew is saying. <laughs> so, <laughs> the English cleans it up quite a bit. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainties here. Uh, there's apparently a curbing that runs along here in front of these guard rooms. Exactly how big it was or what it was doing, not clear. Now the fascinating thing is, in the description, there are no doors. When you read the description of the gates, there are no doors. I think that's on purpose. God says, come on in. Come on in. You want to be like me? Come on in. You don't want to be like me, you better stay out. But it's not, this wall of separation is not to keep people out. It's just to make it clear there is a separation between what is godlike and what is not godlike. Ben? Does that make it even more profound that the gates are ridiculously, like almost 10 times bigger? So, entry point, entry point, here you go. Here you go. <laughs> yeah, right, you can't, you can't miss it. <laughs> <laughs> Interestingly, they seem to be the same height as the temple, which again is kind of interesting. But here's, here's the point. We're making it clear. My people never really got this straight, never really got clear that I am radically other in my character, in my nature. Now I hope you're going to get it, he says. And come on in. Of course, there is a... And again, 
It's not at all clear. There are those who say there was another wall here. There are clearly, um, and my drawing is not the best, but anyway. Um, there are gates here, also 85 feet tall. Yeah. For sure, this platform is higher than this is, uh, 13 steps higher. So uh, one of the commentators that I read that made a good deal of sense to me says, in fact, there was no wall here so that the common people standing here could see what's going on here on the great high altar. It's, it's up, whatever 9 times 13 inches is, <laughs> it's, it's, there, there's a separation, obviously, but still you can see. Um, these gates, again, would then be simply stairway access to this higher platform. And um, as I mentioned in the uh, text there, it's not clear. There are rooms for the preparation of sacrifices. Are they in both gates? Maybe. Are they in the gates? Maybe. Are they outside the gates? Maybe. Is there only one on the north side? Maybe. <laughs> Not quite clear. There are rooms for preparing sacrifices. But there they are. Then we're going to see next week buildings all around. There are, there are buildings all around this wall. Uh, 13 on a side, what those buildings are for, not clear. Uh, the ones in the corners are kitchens for uh, cooking sacrificial meat, but other than that, we don't know. There's a huge building, and again, this is not very clear. There's a huge building back here, and what in the world it was for, there's no specification at all. There are buildings on the side of the temple. There are buildings on the edge of this platform. Not clear. But again, all of them are symmetrical. The buildings on this side are the same shape as the buildings on that side. The buildings up against the wall here are the same as the ones over here. Everything balanced. Ordered. Everything ordered. Yes. 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 OK. Um, There's much more emphasis here on sacrifice. If you look at uh, chapter 40, verses 38 through 43, it, Solomon's temple, it's amazing. In his prayer, there is not a word about this as a place of sacrifice. It's a house of prayer. But this one, the rooms for preparing the sacrifices, and next week we'll see the discussion of the altar and the sacrifices that are to be made there. Uh, what do you think? Why more of a stress on sacrifice here? Purity, okay. All right, all right. The cleansing of the sin, the iniquity that had been part of the first temple. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So you're making fun of the other gods by showing, like, because the other gods think you guys were really big on sacrifice. But um, like, I can do this. Like, if you let me, you see how ordered I can be? Mm -hmm. I can do their game better than they can because I chose to. I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility. Personal awareness. Pardon? Personal awareness. Personal awareness? Yeah, I didn't have to think a lot. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If we think of this building, 
as symbolizing Christ, the sacrifice, the sacrifice. And if we think of it as symbolizing the church, take up your cross and follow me. Is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid? Yeah, yeah. I think probably it's those kinds of things that are going on here. And when you come then to Hebrews, uh, those priests had to bring in another sacrifice every year for their own sins. He entered once with a sacrifice that cared for everyone, everywhere, always. Nancy? Um, so when Hebrews talks about all this shadow, yeah. that the iron is the outer, the outer core, it was considered the judgment of iron. Do you remember that? Yeah. You know, and, and the, uh, like it all had a shadow to stand. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which yeah. is kind of interesting how that is. Yeah. So the, the sacrifices that are there in the <laughs> kitchens and on the altar where they're being prepared here in these rooms, uh, again, there is no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. It is not going to be possible for us to experience the holiness of God apart from the blood sacrifice that ultimately Christ supplied. As I said, when we look at the spaces and the way the plan is laid out, we see this symmetry. We see the multiples of the same figures being used, tens, fifties, hundreds, uh, one rod, two rods, one rod, four rods. And again, all of these are laid out with that same kind of symmetry for them. What were the decorations that were used in the temple, Ezekiel's temple? There are two. Cherubim, Cherubim and palm trees. Yes. This temple is a whole lot less ornate than Solomon's was. There's one big thing that is not mentioned here. Gold. Gold. Solomon's temple is just dripping with gold. Gold everywhere. There's no gold here. Why do you think that is? God is sufficient, okay, he provides, he's the source of wealth, okay. I don't mean that, I mean, they put a lot of stock in him, all this wealth, and that was, you know, in a way take the place of what it was. Mm-hmm, you, you mean the Solomonic temple, yes, with all the gold, yes, yes, yes. But I think your royalty that gold represents is already there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The royalty is already there in Christ? Possibly, possibly. Uh, um, the, the issue of re reflection is a little bit up, up in the air. But anyway, that, that's not impossible. Is it that the temple itself is not precious? Yeah. I think that's right. That's right, that's right, that's right. We're looking beyond the building. Yes, yes, I think that's, I think that's what's going on. It's oh, yes, oh, yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it, it simply, it again says, this is symbolic. We're talking about what this points to rather than what it is in and of itself. Yeah, yeah. Now the cherubim here have only two faces, not four. Why do you think that is? Because they're on the wall, it's two dimensional. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes. And whether all you heard that or not, he's the son of man and the lion of Judah. Yes, yes. Also, humanity and nature, all serving God. What about the palm tree? Interesting, in Solomon's temple, it was pomegranates. Now it's the palm tree. What about the psalm tree? The palm trees are on the walls. So you've got a palm tree, a cherub, palm tree, cherub, on the cedar walls. Eden? <laughs> oh yeah, that one. <laughs> Probably, probably it goes the other way, that because of the nature of the palm tree, you're using it to praise the king. Uh, the idea that it is constantly replacing itself. So it's representative of life. You know, when you see the palm tree, it's the former ends of fronds that are making up the bark now, and it's, it's constantly coming out of the top and more and more. So uh, he's the source of life, life that goes on and on. I wonder, too, if it had symbolic meaning when we talked about coming home. These were things that they saw at home mm -hmm. when they were mm -hmm. in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, could be. So this is what's going on here in terms of what it's symbolizing. Symbolizing again, God's desire to come home. God's desire to take up a residence among us. Symbolizing again, you've got to distinguish between the holy and the common. Not to devalue the common, but on the other hand, not to blur the reality. God is God. <laughs> and to drag him down to our level is not to do any of us a favor. The idea of the beauty of holiness, that perfect symmetry, perfect order, the idea of the sacrifice, that Christ has made available to us, it is possible for us to be a holy people because of what he has done. And in the end then, he calls us to that life, life eternal, which is possible through the Son of Man and the Lion of Judah. So, all of this that's happening, as, as we saw there in chapter 43, all of this is to get the people thinking. Hmm, wow. What could be, what might be for us in our relationship with God? The gates are wide open. And he says, come on in. Come on in. Okay. That's what I wanted to say. <laughs> what would you like to say? <laughs> Could 
this seem like if this actually happened, and like it being symmetrical, blood would be all over the place. Because you have the kitchens, and so they would, they would separate each blood everywhere. So outside is death, but it's sacrificial, but it's purity, but inside there's life. Mm -hmm. The contrast between death and life. Mm-hmm. All hearts clear? <laughs> when you talk about the difference of the gates, can you go over the eastern versus the other? Uh, well, my point there was that they're exactly the same. Oh, okay. That, that there the, any no, there is no difference the, and in any of them, from, from the three on the outer wall or to these two on the, uh, actually there's three, there, there's one here too on the, uh, on the east. Again, it, it's this steady progression and it is, they're identical. Yeah, yeah. Gary. On the altar, yes, yeah, 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 uh, because of the priest going up, yeah. and and uh, uh, they had to. It, it's interesting. You can you can you can make the Bible contradict itself. Uh, there are other places where they are going up, and God specifies they have to have underwear on. <laughs> so again, it's it's the issue of. If you're not going to wear underwear, there are no steps here. <laughs> but if you will wear underwear, it's okay. <laughs> uh, I should say that as far as the descriptions go, the steps are in the gates. They're not just generally around anywhere. Oh. They're, they're in the gates. And so that could make a difference as well. Good observation. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you that the gates are wide open. Thank you that you call us in. Thank you that you invite us to share your heart, to share your life. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the emblem of perfection. Thank you that you have made it possible that we can come into the Holy of Holies, sharing your character and the character of the Father, that we can abide and that you will abide. Praise you. Glory to your name. Amen.